Good evening. Glad to be here. Glad to see all of you back with us and to see some new faces even today. And uh, we are going to be looking at Luke 2 again. We're going to be looking at some of the details of the thing that was read to us. And I appreciate the brother doing such a good job uh, reading that. The scriptures deserve our utmost, our best attention. And he did a good job reading those things to us. We had a delicious Asian meal sponsored by the Kramers today. I got to sit right there next to them and soak it all up. It was great. We just really have had a great time. It's been wonderful getting to know them a little bit and getting to know you all. And I'm anticipating having ourselves a fantastic week, or at least half the week. And then we'll have to go back home. But we are talking about the questions that Jesus asked. And, and the reason we're talking about these things is because, as we talked about this morning, that little bit of irritant that goes inside that muscle, the shell of that clam or that mollusk becomes something beautiful. But it has to be irritating to start. There's something that gets in there and gets... And what Jesus is trying to do when He asks questions, typically, is to penetrate beyond the surface of what we use to protect ourselves. We all have a little bit of a shell. We've all got a little bit of a wall, some sort of defense that keeps people from seeing us. We don't like to be overly vulnerable. We don't want to be too exposed. And so we put up some walls and shields and kind of keep people out sometimes because we're not really sure we want everybody to know what we think. And what Jesus is saying is that all of your thoughts and all of your heart needs to be completely open to God. After all, there's nothing you've ever done, nothing you've ever thought that God doesn't already know about. So open yourself to Him. Let Him work on you. Let Him be the master potter who takes this clay that you provide to make something beautiful. In order to do that, you have to be open to the kind of prompting that Jesus offers in these questions. So there are questions that Jesus asks that are like the questions sometimes people ask us. You kind of think to yourself, well, why would... Why would you even ask that? Why would you think that? Let me give you a quick example of that. When I was young, our next door neighbor, who was a good old country boy, he moved in, a, a confirmed bachelor, and he brought the most exotic thing I'd ever seen in my life up to that point. He had chow chows. And they were all black. Black and silky blue blackness. They were crazy looking lion dogs and I'd never seen anything like it and they'd sit around with their mouths open and those purple tongues would be hanging out and you're just I thought maybe I had you know breathed something funny I didn't know what it was but these were the most vicious terrible animals i would ever met the most ill-tempered they're like cats they were so bad tempered and so he was living right there next door to us and I would cut his grass and one year he got a great big old rust-colored chow. It wasn't a purebred. It was way too big to be a purebred chow. But the reason he got it is because the guy who had the farm where he was at, this dog was killing uh, baby goats and pigs. And he brought them to the suburbs. That was a great idea. And so this dog, he'd turn dogs loose at the end of every day. He'd come home from work. He'd turn them loose, and they'd go running. And sure enough, one day old Rusty... Comes home doing this number. He's throwing something in the air and catching it, which was a pretty good trick. He's throwing it in the air, trotting along, throw it, catch it, trotting, catch it. Behind him was the owner, or either the father of the owner, of what he was throwing up. It was a C-A-T cat. And uh, walks up there, and of course, Rusty, like a good dog, drops that cat at Rodney's feet and this guy who is fuming got this crying little girl next to him just infuriated he says is this your dog and Rodney says yep is that your cat <laughs> it was and this guy begins to rant and rave about what a dangerous animal this was and how terrible. He was one of the most harmless. He was the nicest dog that Rodney owned. Wasn't safe around cats, but he was really good around people. And this guy starts ranting and raving about what a terrible beast this is. And Rodney says, well, I mean, if you'd like to shoot him, you can go ahead. 
You know, that's country answer right there. You know, I let they put the dog down. The guy said, that's not the point. And he rants and raves a little bit longer. And Rodney says, I've got a gun right inside. If you, you may go get it, I'll let you do it or I'll do it. You know, whatever you prefer, you know, you know, eye for an eye kind of a thing. And the guy just keeps saying, you're missing the point, you're missing the point. And he finally says his last piece. And Rodney says, well, I don't know what you want me to do for you. But I can tell you it's like this. It's killer instinct. You've got it. I've got it. That dog's got it. That cat used to have it. And at that point, this guy just walked away. He wasn't going to get what he wanted. It was was impossible to satisfy him. There are questions that people ask us, and people come into your life, and you're not exactly sure what it is that they're looking for. And when they finally start talking to you about it, you're still about as confused as you were before. Because there's something that precludes They're speaking to you. There's something bigger than what you can see on the surface. There's something much more detailed and much more deeply involved than what it was that you've seen. The same thing is true here with Jesus. And it is in Luke, the second chapter, after we've seen the birth of Jesus and we see the genealogy of Jesus, we find out that Jesus is growing in every way like a child is supposed to. That he's actually a very good child. Verse 40 says, He became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. The grace of God was upon him. He's a, he's a very good boy. There are a lot of people who've talked about this passage and they've translated into their minds the modern tween. And they've got Jesus saying the things that he says in his text in sort of a snarky or smart alecky way. And I just couldn't imagine that's anything just further from the truth. I just can't imagine that that's the way it is. Jesus is a very good young man. And he's trying to do what his parents want him to do. He's trying to do what God wants him to do. But in this text, what you see is that this family is going to Jerusalem because they are always doing that for Passover. Now this is, by the way, how we get the accounting of how Uh, we get that three to three and a half years of Jesus' public work and His preaching and teaching is because we're using uh, these these particular Passovers and John records all three of them and that's kind of how we get the the whole picture of that. But here is the first one and it's, it's interesting for our purposes this week that the first recorded words of Jesus are two questions. Even as a child, He's doing this. But here at the beginning you see in verse 41 and 42... When he's 12 years old, they go up to Jerusalem because this is what they did. Why? Because they're faithful Jews. This is a commandment of the law. There are three feasts that all Jews are supposed to keep and come faithfully to the city of Jerusalem, the place which God, the Lord, had designated. And so, after the time of the feast is over and they're going back, these families would frequently travel together in packs like caravans because a lot of them would be coming from the same cities. All the faithful Jews from Nazareth and probably their different clans would travel together and the children would mix in among them. I don't know if it was like it for, was for us, but for you, when the families all get together, the grown-ups sit around and talk and the kids play together. Have you seen that experience? So it was with us. And it was more than once where one of the kids would get left at Aunt so-and-so's house or Uncle so-and-so's house because they were playing and the family left and they didn't realize until a little bit later they were one shot. I was the youngest of five. I got left all kinds of places. And so this is the same kind of case with these people. They've all been gummy. They kind of came as a group. They're leaving as a group. And everybody assumes that 12-year-old Jesus is with some party or another in their group. After all, he's never caused any trouble. He's a good boy. He's the firstborn of this family in this particular uh, division of the family. And so they didn't find him. Now, I don't know if you've ever been left anywhere. I got left at church a couple of times. But it was always moments. You know, that was corrected in just moments of time. Days. <laughs> oh, oh, where is Jesus? They can't find Him, and so they go back to the last place they knew that He was. After three days, they found Him in the temple, verse 46, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. They found Jesus at the temple. Now I know when you're looking at this, you're seeing this young boy, this 12-year-old Jesus, you're probably not thinking about a 12-year-old boy thinking the temple's a cool place to be. 
I can't imagine why a 12 year old would do that. But if that 12 year old was God in the flesh, the temple was his home away from home. Jesus, before he became Jesus of Nazareth, had been communing with the people for thousands of years of history, wherever it was that God had designated. Where was the Ark of the Covenant? Where was the holiest of holies? This was where God met with the people. During all the time of their faithfulness, this is where God met. So this was the most natural place in the world for Jesus to be. He was used to communing with people on this temple mount, and that had been for hundreds of years. Really? So, this is where they find Him. Very interesting uh, subject here, the answering and asking of questions. Uh, no one's surprised when they see that Jesus is asking questions. He's a 12-year-old. But people look at this and they say, well, this is where Jesus is getting his, um, his education. You know, although he didn't have letters, as it will be later identified, he'll be pointed out as having no formal education. This is where Jesus, he got his formal theological education. Most of the time, people who say that believe that you need to have a formal theological education. They believe you need to go to some kind of seminary or some kind of special school. And I'm holding the school that you need to go to. You are too. Becoming familiar with this book is a whole lot more valuable than learning homiletics. It's a whole lot more important than learning hermeneutics, either the old or the new. This book right here and understanding what's in it as one singular story is a whole lot more important than any theology class you've ever taken. And if you get your doctrine in divinity, I've never understood that, how you can become a doctor of God... But anyway, if you can get that kind of degree, I guess more power to you. But this is where you need to plant yourself. Do you know there's a significant percentage, a significant percentage of men and women who are teaching at modern theological seminaries that do not believe in the plenary inspiration of the Bible. They don't believe that God verbally inspired this book. And they explained to us that Mark was the first gospel and all the other gospels used Mark as a source and that's why they have these similarities and all this kind of stuff. And not once did they ever mention the Holy Spirit was the director of the whole show. And so they want to explain to you how Jesus could know so much about the law. Well, this is the beginning of it, obviously. Let me tell you what's really going on. During the time of Jesus, when He's growing up, this is exactly how the teachers of the law taught. They would come up with questions to ask children and young men who were being trained in the law, and they wanted to see how they would answer them. When you sit at the Pharisees' feet, when you sit at the scribes' feet, it was going to be interactive. They weren't just going to spout off about the law. They were going to ask you questions to see if you could answer questions using the law. And so what we have here in this particular instance is verse 47. All who heard Him were astonished at His understanding and answers. If this is where Jesus was getting His spiritual education, how did He come up with the answers? Someone says, well, He was cheating. He was God. Don't be ridiculous. Jesus has never not been God. And it's not cheating for him to be God, even when he's 12. And I hear all of this business, and I read all these different books, and people say, well, the public ministry of Jesus began when he's probably about the age of 30, and this is where he did. The public ministry of Jesus began right here, in this temple, right here, with him asking and answering questions, him being a respectful student, and him being a teacher at only 12 years of age. Now, this is where they find him. This is the situation... And the people who are there have gathered in amazement and astonishment. Now, I don't know who all is there, but I can tell you some of the people who are there are the teachers of the law. But it sounds as if it's other people too who've gathered there, who've seen this. They just can't believe this 12-year-old is doing what he's doing. He's saying the things that he's saying. He's very impressive. So when they find him there, Mary pulls what it is... I'd say is the most mothery mother thing of all time. Now you could as a mother, you could as a mother see this and be like, wow, look at our son. He's in here answering and asking questions. The law, it's really impressive. But what does she do? Where have you been? We've been looking for you. 
That's, I mean, that's a mother for you right there. That, that is, we've been worried sick. Where were you had us worried? We, we were worried something could have happened to you. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you ever hear one of those threats or give one of those threats? I was so worried about you. I'm going to beat you to death. You know, it's just, well, Jesus is listening to her ask this question. Where have you been? We've sought you diligently. Your father and I have sought you anxiously. This is where we get to Jesus' question. Now, before we get to that question, I want you to read down there at the end of this, verse 51. He went down with them. He came to Nazareth, was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. Have you ever thought about the unfolding of all of these things in Mary's mind? The whole way Jesus came into the earth was completely mind-blowing. If that had happened to you, you know, she was the only person who knew for a fact, besides God, that she was a virgin. Joseph took it as a fact, but he, did, he, did he know that? I think he believed that, but did he know it? He couldn't know it. She knew it. And of all the people on the earth, she was 100% factually in the knowledge that she had never known a man. And so from that moment on, she knows something is unusual about this kid. And she's been told by the angel Gabriel, there are some special things about him. And what's going to unfold is going to be absolutely world changing. But at the same time, that doesn't change your perspective as a person who's watching your child grow up. It doesn't change the fact that she's still his mother and she still worries like a mother does and she's still concerned about his future like a mother would be. And she's watching all of these things. But when he says to her, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? When she had said, your father and I sought you anxiously. And who is she talking about? When she says, father, she's talking about Joseph. And when Jesus says, I must be about my father's business, he is not talking about Joseph. These first recorded words of Jesus, they reveal that he is already 100% turned toward what God wants him to be doing. So, what is this? <laughs> what is the father's business. Literally, this could be translated as, did you not know it must be about my father's house? There's some translations that read like that. It's probably more accurately translated as affairs or issues or business like it is here. But it doesn't have any of those words in the text. It just says, did you not know I must be about my father's? And that's what the possessive, that's what the apostrophe. That it must be about my father's. That's literally the way the text reads when you read that in the Greek. And I think it's an interesting thing. It, 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 enc it encompasses a whole lot of things. That whatever the Father has me here for, that's what I'm here about. And so it raises some pretty interesting question. What is the Father's business? What is it that Jesus has come to do? Again, what's He going to do? Some super impressive stuff. He's going to still the seas. He's going to bring back the dead. He's going to heal the blind and the lame and the deaf. He's going to take care of leprosy. He's going to walk on water. He's going to commune with Elijah and Moses. He's going to do all of these things among many witnesses. He's going to turn water into wine. There's going to be an all, all just manner of things. What he's going to do over the next couple decades, eventually he's going to show that he has power over earth, that he has power over disease, that he has power over death. That he has power over sin. Because he's going to forgive people's sins. And why does he do all of these things? Why is he doing these miracles? It is for one purpose. Now all the people who are teaching about miracles today and who believe in modern miracles, they believe in the spiritual gifts moving among us today, let me tell you why they're doing that. It is dramatic. It's super exciting. And we want to be in on all of that drama. We love the idea that those really crazy wild things are happening. But what they've done is they've missed the whole point of miracles altogether. Signs, miracles, and wonders, as explained in the New Testament, are the calling cards of God. It is a sign that points. 
It is a wonder that creates awe. It is a demonstration of power. And all of it is for this purpose. To give the speaker credibility. To make sure you listen to this person. What they've done got your attention. Undeniably, this person must be from God. Now, how can you know if I'm from God? Read this text with me. And if it says what I tell you it's saying, there you go. If it doesn't, there you go. Because I am imperfect. As these people would have been imperfect. But once you saw the miracles, you'd know. So Jesus is doing these miracles. Why? Check it out. Watch it. Watch every time. Jesus goes on lots of talking after he goes on lots of miracling. He does all kinds of wonders, but he gets the attention of the people, then he lays it down. So, what's the Father's business? It's not feeding the thousands. It's not housing the homeless. It's not having a good time. What is the Father's business? The Father's business... Saving souls. It's as simple as that. That's why the Father sent Jesus. That's why Jesus is here. That's what the whole thing is about. So, let's use the powers and the, the, the education that you got from your school. What's the transitive property? <laughs> if the business of the Father is A, and the Father establishes a church, then the business of the church will then be also A. Will it not? Isn't that the way that works? I don't know much about math, but I do know that's true. That whatever God set up the church to be, that's what the church should be. And God's only going to set up the church to do what He wants it to do. So what does He want the church to do? Well, it might be easier to answer a few questions about what He doesn't want the church to do. Does he want the church to wall itself off from the community and bring in the good, clean people and keep them from getting dirty with all the naughty people? Is that what he wants? Okay. That's one question down. Does God want the evangelistic plan of the church to be this? This is a good one. We, this one's a really good one. We're going to put the times of services on the sign out front and if people want the truth they'll come to us and get it how's that for an evangelism plan you like that one some of you don't like that what if we just put the time of services on the website so people all over the world can know when we're getting together talk about what's right how would that be is that a good evangelism plan we got the truth I mean I got mine you got yours are you saved you, are you safe? You, you in good shape? If the, the roof collapses or Jesus comes, you're going to be okay tonight? You personally, are you going to be okay tonight? Man, I hope you are. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what you got up to this afternoon, but if <laughs> you're in some kind of need, we might need to talk some more. But are you going to be okay? Is that what God wants? I don't know how many people live in Logan County or Todd County or... The ones around here. You know, at one time I knew all the different names of all the counties. There are 120 in the state of Kentucky. Seventh and eighth grade Phil knew that. 46-year-old Phil does not know. He's glad he saw the signs on the way in. What is Jesus saying? What is Jesus doing? Can I just try to boil it down to one sentence? Jesus comes to earth for this reason. To tell us that God loves us, wants to forgive us, and bring us home. Have I oversimplified that? Now, are there details that must be discussed and applied? Yes, there are. Will God accept whatever behavior you offer Him and say, that's good enough? He will not. But is that not the basic message? Jesus says, God loves you. And yeah, he knows you're a wreck. He's been watching the whole show. He knows you're a mess. And he knows specifically in what way you are a mess. But he's telling me to tell you he can wash all of that clean. 
He can get you started with a brand new slate. And you can live the life you were designed to live. I think we forget that from time to time. God designed humans. He knows how to get the most out of the human experience. And the advice that He's giving and the structure in which He places us, and the commandments that He gives, those are to maintain the optimal human experience. People think it's freedom to abuse themselves with drugs and alcohol and sex and gambling and pornography. They say, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. Those things are slave drivers. Every one of those things is a way to enslave a human. Real freedom is finding God and your purpose in Him and living that to its fullness. It'll be the most fulfilling life you could ever find. Well, Jesus is saying, this is what I'm here for. This is the business that I've come for. Now, there's been some good prayers offered here today. But I can tell you, I've been a lot of different places. And there are so many repeated prayers. You can tell when a guy's given a prayer that he's prayed a thousand times. And usually they have something to do with thanking God for having a safe place we can come without molestation from the government. A guide, garden, direct, that's always a good one. And most of the time what you're hearing is that we're praying to God, we're thanking Him for the comfort that we're enjoying. We're thanking Him for the freedom that we have. We are hoping that God can preserve our happiness and our comfort and our safety. Now I want you to go into your New Testament and I want you to find where that prayer is being offered. One of the first prayers you see the church praying is in Acts the fourth chapter. It's because tremendous persecution is crashing upon them. They're being arrested. Some of them are being taken to jail. The threats of death are already rising because the church is growing so fast. And what do the disciples get together and pray for in Acts 4? Lord, we pray that you'll look on these threats. And you think you're about to get it. You think you're about to Oh, they're going to say, Lord, strike them down. Stop these heathens from messing with the church. Because after all, we know we're the right ones and they're the wrong ones. Lord, give them some what for. And tell them we sent you. You know what they say? Lord, look on these threats and grant that your servants may speak with boldness the truths that have been revealed in the gospel. And it says that place was shaken because the Holy Spirit falls upon that place. And you know what they do? At the beginning of chapter 5, they go out and they preach the word with boldness. And you know what happens? They get arrested. They don't even ask for deliverance from their persecution. When you look in Ephesians, the first chapter, you see right there what Paul is saying. And my prayer for you, it's also in Colossians, my prayer for you is that you be filled with all knowledge and wisdom and discernment and strength. When was the last time we prayed for that? When was the last time you heard somebody stand and say, Lord, grant us the boldness to have the courage to tell the truth about Jesus to everyone we meet. Give us the strength and the wisdom that comes from your word. Give us a heart for doing what's right. Set us on fire for your purpose. When was the last time we prayed that? We're satisfied to say thank you for this beautiful day. Help the sick people get better. Thanks for, you know, freedom in this country. We like the air conditioning. It's really nice. You know what's happened? We've done what we do with everything. Americans make everything American. <laughs> we Americanize music. <laughs> we Americanize food. You know, most of the restaurants you go to that sell any kind of ethnicity of food, most of them have been reduced from their original state to be an Americanized version of those foods. You know, spaghetti and pizza didn't appear in Italy that way. 
We think of that as Italian food. Those are Americanized versions of those things. We call those little sandwiches with meat in the middle hamburgers. And we think, well, obviously, those were invented in Hamburg, Germany. Not so. Not true at all. So what we've done with the church is we've said, I want to do this, and I want this to be our business. And we said, God bless it. Here's what we're going to do. This is the way we're going to do church. We're going to come to church. And we're going to do church. And then we're going to go and we're going to do our own business. God bless that. That's what we want. We want God to give us what we're doing and to give us that in spades over and over again. God give us what we want. Is that what God said? Let's, let's get a couple of things clear. You don't go to church. You don't do church. You are the church. And if you embrace that, it will empower you with something totally different than what you've ever had before. We don't come here and have worship happen to us. We come here and we worship. It's a verb. It's something we engage and when we do that in its appropriate measure, we are altered by it because we've come into the presence of God. And once you've come into the presence of God, you are forever changed. But you can come and you can sing songs and listen to prayers and listen to sermons, a little pinch, a little sip. You can do all of that and never be altered even one iota. You can do that and people do that decade after decade after decade. And you know what they do? They live however they want. And they kind of they give a little pittance to God every once in a while. A little bit of money. A little bit of attendance. Then they want Chris to stand over the grave. And they want Chris to just go on. Oh, what a godly and holy person this was. We all want these beautiful words spoken of us. I tell you what we all could do. Live in such a way that nobody has to say anything at your funeral because the people who come realize you made the earth a little bit better but because you kept pointing at heaven. There's no sermon to preach. There's just nothing to be said. You said it all. Got your date of birth. Got the dash, your date of death. That dash is yours. That's where you're preaching the funeral, right there. He won't have to convince anybody. I would never have to convince anybody how good or how righteous or how holy or how pious you were. Nobody who's ever met you will know anything different than that. Because you gave yourself wholeheartedly to God and everybody saw it. Because you gave yourself to them. You gave the truth to everybody you met. What, what do our prayers, what do our lives tell people is the business of God? Because He's not just Jesus' Father. He's your Father. He's your father too. And when people say, what are you doing with your life? You say, I must be about my father's business. So what's left of the father's business for you to do this week? When was the last time you reached out to try to save a soul? I mean, really save them. That means you, you put up with the silly things they say and you do what it is you can do for them, regardless of how they treat you, or whatever they say about you or to you, you just keep on at it. Well, here's your last question. When we leave here, you go and ask this question. You go to work tomorrow, go to your neighbor and ask, is there a meaning to life? If so, what do you think that meaning is? You want to start a conversation... That's a good way to do it, right there. Is there a meaning to life? Not, not, are you alive? Are you thriving? What's the purpose? What's the point of the whole thing? Brethren, we can make a difference everywhere we go. But we will never do that accidentally. None of us are accidentally going to go to heaven. None of us are going to slip through the ignorant holes. I had. heard one guy preach one time. I was like, oh my goodness. Really? And I think that's sometimes what people are hoping for. I'm going to stay ignorant. I'm just going to be dumb enough. I'm just going to limit my... Because 
I've read that passage somewhere along the way. Someone says, of whom much is given, much will be required. So I'm just going to keep myself down here on the low end of what I know. And that way, ain't the way it works. God judges us about what we're capable of. And you know what? You're the only one who knows the truth about that. You and God. So you can face Him with what you've got, what you've done, what you are. But trust me when I say He knows everything, including what you can and what you could do. So let's go out from this place and make a difference in people's lives by being kind and showing them what Jesus would do if He was here, but also by telling them we're interested in them in a way that no one else has really ever showed an interest. Enough interest in their spirits to defy their bodies, to defy their wishes, to defy their comfort, to defy, defy, defy their happiness in order to get to the thing that they really need to do. Let's do that. Is there anyone here who's not obeyed the gospel? I couldn't explain it to you in the last few seconds I have here if you don't already know what it means. If you know what it means, then you know what you need to do. If you don't know what it means, I'm right here. Chris is right here. You've got fine elders right here. They'd be happy to talk to you about it. But chances are pretty good. If you've thought about obeying the gospel, you know what you need to do. So I'm not going to say any more about it. I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm going to spring it on you. It's time for you to obey the gospel.